Good afternoon. Uh, good morning for those who it might be morning and good evening for those who it might be evening. We are very pleased to have you join us today. Uh, my, uh, name is, my name is Maggie Ragan from the National Business Conduct. And today we'll be tackling a very topical issue on the COVID vaccine hesitancy and access uh, on a research, based on research that we have had over the last couple of months. We have an exciting panel to share with you and we're looking forward to a very good discussion on this. Um, as you join uh, participants, uh, I'd ask you to kindly use the chat box Please put the, your name and the organization that you represent, and we will. And any questions that arise in the course of the symposium, and we will use that during the session, uh, the panel session, and the Q and A. So please feel free to populate your questions, and we will make sure we tackle as many as possible during the panel session. Um, so, without further ado. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Gidenji Gitahi, AMREF Health Africa Group CEO, to make opening remarks. I know Dr. Gidenji is really passionate about this vaccine and COVID vaccination, and he has actually been standing up front and, and making people aware of the importance of this issue. And I invite him to open with remarks and then and discuss and, and bring us our speakers to discuss. Thank you. Dr. Gidenji, over to you. Well, thank you, Maggie. Thank you very, very much. And I'm very delighted to have so many colleagues here to join us for this conversation, which is extremely pivotal. So I'll, I'll be introducing your speakers today, um, you know, shortly. Um, and uh, I see that we have uh, almost 70 people now, which is a, you know, a really good attendance for this session. And, um, you know, I must say, I've just had a rant on Twitter just a few minutes ago. And uh, Dr. Steven now, who is the uh, UN resident coordinator, is uh, probably our beacon of diplomacy here. So I am very undiplomatic on Twitter. And the fight is with the European Union. And um, uh, I was talking this morning about vaccine equity. And the reason for that is that for some time, we have talked around the issue of avoiding to exacerbate inequalities in vaccine access, which already exist. And currently I have seen that the European Union on the Schengen visa site has actually posted the vaccines which are acceptable for vaccine, uh, for travel certificate for vaccines. And out of those, the only AstraZeneca vaccine that has been posted is the one that's available in Europe and not Covishield which is what African governments and Indian governments are actually receiving from a multilateral arrangement of COVAX through WHO and Gavi. And therefore, for me, that is unacceptable. And I've called it out on Twitter. So, um, uh, Dr. Stephen, if the EU ambassador calls you to complain about me today, please know I'm reporting myself in advance. Uh, this is the reason we're here, and I know you will talk about these issues, so you, you can check that out. I've actually checked their page and gone through and have taken screenshots. It is absolutely unacceptable, and I am calling on Gavi, WHO, Africa Union, Africa CDC, and the EU Commission itself, and the EMA, to actually retract, either retract the travel certificate or uh, it's their responsibility to look out for COVID shield uh, through EMA and make sure it's listed because it is actually what is being received uh, multilaterally. So now I finish my rant there and then I move on to the topic of the day. And the topic of the day today is vaccine inequity, exactly what I've been talking about. Now, I know we have great speakers here, so I'm not going to try and uh, take away their thunder. My role is to introduce the topic and introduce the speakers. One of the things I would like to say is that though we are talking about vaccine hesitancy and access today, I tend to look at vaccine inequity in two ways, between countries and within countries. And, um, and uh, the role of, um, or the dimension of between countries can be reflected fairly well in terms of the, the fiscal and global inequity that exists that I've just been talking about. Despite um, you know, Africa contributing to 
of clinical trials for vaccines, Africa has only received 1.6% of the vaccines that have been administered, which speaks largely to multiple moral failures because even on the side of clinical trial, there is an ethical framework to say that people who participate in clinical trials have a priority of access, which means that that has failed to begin with. Even before we talk about fiscal failures, the fiscal failure I would like to reflect on is the fact that in the continent, if I was to look at any of the countries in Africa, and uh, on average, public expenditure per capita on health uh, for some countries, it will be around $11. For countries that are probably low middle income countries like Kenya will be $40 to $50. And uh, for many other countries, therefore, you can say largely will range between 10 and 50, depending on, you know, largely around uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. If you look at that as a public health expenditure per capita, and that includes partner support on budget, partner support, organized development aid for health on budget, then you can say that at a cost of 15 to 20 dollars uh, per person vaccinated, meaning two doses and the cost of vaccination, you're talking about half the per capita expenditure going to vaccination on COVID alone without taking into consideration the other things. So fiscally, it's impossible for Africa and for low, low income countries and low middle income countries to actually take upon the COVID vaccination as national duty which then speaks to global solidarity and the need for global solidarity. And this is part of the reason why there's such a huge fiscal and global inequity. The second thing is obviously the inequity created by disruption of global supply. As we have seen, the COVAX plan, which was heavily dependent on availability of AstraZeneca, COVID shield specifically, disrupted by the rise of uh, COVID infections in India and therefore nationalization of the SII, and then not rapid enough knowledge sharing and licensing of manufacturers to take up manufacturing of other vaccines, meaning that even the call for temporary suspension of intellectual property comes in in this discussion. Uh, the third point on this between countries is um, that uh, is the vaccine travel restrictions I've just talked about, that when rich countries put travel restrictions based on vaccination, they exacerbate inequality within countries because the middle class who want to travel will then use whatever means is possible to access vaccines ahead of those who deserve them most, who are the people at risk, including health workers. We know obviously that the vaccines kill up, you know, following the G7, following the conversation that COVAX, that vaccines kill up is going to happen. Vaccines are going to be available. I think that we will have um, probably adequate doses in Africa by the end of this year, going by all the commitments that we've seen. Um, and you know, I am, I am kind of trying to be an optimist here that we may have uh, some doses before the end of this year. They may be delayed, but we will get, even if it's early next year. But now we talk about the, um, the, you know, the, the inequity within countries, which is now what is going to bring us to this vaccine hesitancy, that access to vaccines is a big challenge within countries. Uh, if I look at um, just a recent analysis that I saw, I think it's from the Tony Blair Institute, I was looking at countries in terms of doses received and doses administered. Burkina Faso, 0% by the time I was looking at this data, which was made, 0% administered despite presence of vaccines. South Sudan, Djibouti, DRC, Benin, 5% of all doses, uh, of doses administered from the ones received. Niger, 20%. Mauritania, 7%. Madagascar, Cameroon, 15, 13%. Central African Republic and Gabon, 23%. Guinea-Bissau, 14%. Well, we have countries like Kenya doing 98% absorption. There are countries that are lagging behind. So even within Africa and within countries, there's a huge inequity of access. And this access could be uh, you know, could be summarizing, number one is who is receiving? Are we giving the most deserving? How are they receiving? Is there outreach or campaign mode access? Or are they supposed to pay $10 to access the nearest facility and $10 to go back home to access the vaccine? Access to information that is becoming a barrier to access. And this is not deliberate um, access, uh, you know, it's not deliberate hesitancy or skepticism. It is created by the fact that there is a vacuum of information from 
uh, reliable sources like government that is given proactively to overcome hesitancy. So people who don't get information result in equitable access because they receive information from sources that are giving them skepticism and hesitancy. And therefore, the need for the governments to talk about how to scale up proper communication strategies to the necessary people. You know, yesterday I had a community health worker asking me, you know, I was told to receive my second dose on, on eight weeks and now I can't find it. Am I in trouble? And that's a community health worker. Yet the government has already changed its policy, done a public announcement that's now 12 weeks, but a community health worker in Nairobi has no idea. So the role of government in actually overcoming hesitancy by playing his role. So we are going to go straight to the speakers. I don't want to take the thunder from them. And my first speaker, of course, is the government. And uh, I'm going to ask the cabinet assistant secretary, someone who is highly respected in this space, uh, Dr. Masai Masi, that people truly appreciate your role in the COVID-19 response in Kenya. Everyone calls upon you when they want to get a guidance because you've been center of this response. So we truly, truly appreciate your being here with us. And I would like to ask you, what lessons has Kenya learned so far on the COVID vaccine uptake, considering all the things I've, I've said? You have your four minutes starting now. Over to you, Doc. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Girinji um, Gitahi, um, one, for moderating so very well our panel today, but also for being a partner with us in the Ministry of Health when it comes to not only COVID issues and, you know, basically really everything in the public health system we've worked with you. I'd like to extend my appreciation to the NBCC team um, and all other partners who've worked with us in making one this meeting possible, but also appreciating the tremendous, tremendous work that NBCC has started uh, doing since the beginning of this pandemic. Um, today we're here, we're discussing um, key lessons concerning the uptake of the COVID-19 vaccine in Kenya. Um, and I can tell you, um, you know, many, many lessons continue to be collected and learned um, even as we continue deploying, um, you know, the, the strategy, the response strategy, and of course the vaccine uh, deployment that is underway. Um, let me begin by saying that I think one of the biggest lessons is that this is not possible without partnerships. And I've often um, said this and stressed this particularly last year that perhaps what the world has learned in the age of COVID-19 is that the newest innovation is partnerships and collaborations. That's the newest innovation that we have right now. And so it is to thank partnerships with different people who've stepped in and you know stepped up and really supported us, um, recognizing the role of AMREF Health Africa, recognizing the role of WHO, UNICEF, of course, NBCC partners who are here, and many other stakeholders, the UN group agencies at large for really supporting us in the fight against COVID-19. Today, as we discuss um, communication, I think, um, and vaccine hesitancy, I think one of the key things um, that we've learned is um, structure is important. I think structure, when you're trying to define a response, it's always very important to think of how, of what structure will be utilized in trying to deploy that response. And in putting together the structure, I always say it is important to ensure that all stakeholders are in that structure. Now, if we narrow down, um, you know, away from the NERC, which is perhaps the broader structure that manages the COVID response in Kenya, um, to the vaccine um, task force, I think it's very important um, to recognize that as government, we were able to put in together key stakeholders who we felt are absolutely necessary when it comes to the deployment of this um, COVID-19 vaccine. And one of the things we have to appreciate Kenya for is that we've actually had good success in rolling out previous vaccines. I'm sure you've heard of the HPV vaccine, you've heard of new pneumococcal vaccines. Um, and so our, our vaccination immunization program in the ministry, you know, has over time been one of the actually successful programs in the Ministry of Health. And um, perhaps in terms of lessons, and you'll allow me today to sort of, um, you know, have a fine balance between what worked and what didn't work. We were able to put together a structure and the structure of course consisted of experts when it comes to rolling out of vaccines. Um, I think one of the things looking into this perhaps four or five months later into vaccine deployment would be um, ensuring that there's an integral link of this structure with 
the community. And when I say community, I'm talking about not just our community health workers, but also those who are considered as community leaders, those who the community bestows their trust in. So for example, as part of our vaccine deployment task force, um, looking in later, you know, four months later, particularly as we grapple with issues of hesitancy, it would have been important to have a face of local administration. So these are the chiefs, these are the people who are trusted in communities. It would have been important to have religious groups, um, perhaps even have some form of nominations from the interreligious council who are visible and recognized by the community as an integral part of the task force. Of course, we've also had um, different doctors unions, nurses unions, um, you know, different cadre unions in the health space, um, you know, also requesting for engagement and integral linkage with the task force. And when I say this, I do not mean that the task force has not engaged these groups. In fact, it has gone above well and beyond to engage these groups. But when you review the current uptake of the vaccine, when you forecast um, in terms of even when we get new doses, you know, will these doses be utilized? One of the key things that's becoming important is that people always want to be part of the structural team, you know, that is able to deploy this. And in as much as we are balancing numbers and we don't want to have, you know, a huge task force, I'm coming to learn that there's some key integral parts that are need to be part of that team. And so structure is very important, I think. I think the second thing that I've come to learn is then the mechanisms of how you deploy the intervention. When we started through, um, you know, with this, we had prioritized groups. We had our healthcare workers, our essential workers, and then of course we had the over 50 particularly because at that time um, we were going through our surge in the country and those who were passing on were those who were over 58 years of age. Um, I think interestingly as we've continued assessing our response um, we've seen that our communication needed to be very targeted towards those priority groups and I can tell you I've engaged with uh, my fellow healthcare workers I have had the occasion to actually meet um, DCCs um, these are these are deputy county commissioners from the Ministry of Interior and I've also had the chance of meeting teachers particularly when we had exams um, last year and we were engaging a lot with the teachers during supervision and this all these groups all these entities all these priority groups had questions they had questions on you know, what are the components of the vaccine? I remember having to, to answer questions on my phone from the DCC, you know, does it have eggs? Does it have things that I'm allergic to? Does it have sulfur? And so clearly there's a need and there's, there's, a, there's a need for having targeted communication. You know, when you're deploying any communication strategy, especially one that leads to behavior change, it requires to be targeted. And so even as we continued initially, you know, having our daily pressers that were geared towards the whole country, it soon became very clear that we needed um, engagement of these priority groups. And even to this time and age, I can tell you there's still many questions amongst the different um, you know, priority groups, um, you know, from you know, young female nurses, doctors um, asking if this you know, will have an issue with their fertility. And these are the people who should be answering that question because they're the medics. And so really they still need to really you know, find ways of, of ensuring that we package our messaging, taking into consideration that um, the understanding of um, the medics who are priority is different from those in security, is different from those in teachers. And so they're not just one cohort of a group. And so that's very important to look at. Um, I think one thing also we've learned is that there's dynamism. There's dynamism in, in, in communication. Um, I can tell you when it became apparent that we needed to change the second dose from eight weeks to 12 weeks. There was need to quickly be very dynamic in how we communicated that. And yes, um, we did have you know, several daily presses. I was part of the several daily presses, you know, telling the public that we've moved from week eight to 12. But because of factors such as low trust in government, um, perhaps even, um, you know, the preemptiveness that was required as we communicated these messages to the public. Um, there was a lot of doubts, there are a lot of rumors in terms of why are we shifting dates. There was lack of understanding even beyond the supply chain issues of why exactly the date had to move from eight to 12 weeks. There was actually great fear. I do remember in an NERC meeting, um, you know, and this is an intersectional meeting where we have ministers from other um, ministries in, in government. And we had two ministers who actually asked, is it that if I don't get my second those, I will actually be harmed, that I will, you know, be unwell. So people actually perceived it, that lack of a second dose actually places them in a worse off position than that person who perhaps even has not had any um, vaccine. And so again, there's almost, I would dare say, a need and perhaps an appreciation for having some form of translation 
medical anthropology in the room when you're trying to deploy some of these strategies. It becomes very important to have the policymakers supported by a person who understands um, human behavior and, 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 and human perceptions. Um, and I think we could have, of course, better managed um, the change from eight to 12 weeks. Um, I, th I think, again, coupled with um, IT challenges, I think people did get messages at week eight um, in the M changes system. And some people then had to get second messages, moving them further down to 12 weeks. And so again, ensuring that there's sort of synchrony and harmonization in our deployment channels. I do know I have two more minutes left. And I think for those two minutes, um, I'd like to particularly focus then on uh, beyond structure and dynamism in communication um, I think a key, key element of vaccine hesitancy is in agility of the deploying the response. When we started, and even today, as we continue to deploy um, the COVID uh, vaccine, we're using our health facilities. And like I said, Kenya has had a lot of experience in deploying vaccines in different ways, polio, measles, we sort of know how to do it in different sort of setups. It has come to the point where as government, as a Ministry of Health, we are asking ourselves, is this the best way we could deploy this vaccine? If a Kenyan has to spend 100 bob or 200 bob to get to Mbagadi or to get to Mutuini or to get to Chuka district to be able to access a, a, a job, perhaps then we are contributing to the hesitancy because if I only have 200 shillings that I've made that day, I'm not sure I want to spend half of my 200 shillings traveling to get a job. Um, that I'm being told is supposed to protect me um, when I need that income for many other things, my daily needs. And so we've been looking and trying to see perhaps, you know, um, you know, and they say the road to, to, to hell is, is paved with good intentions. Perhaps there's need to look at our mechanism um, of deploying the vaccine. Perhaps certain centers are useful in certain areas, in urban areas, but it may be useful to look at perhaps outreach services, to even look at, um, how do I say, um, non-conformist mechanisms of deploying this vaccine, going to churches on a Sunday, um, capturing the people where they are, going to them. And so these are the lessons that we are learning and all these lessons then therefore require to be uh, translated into something that we can communicate uh, with the public, of course, um, working with all partners, uh, recognizing the role of community health volunteers, um, you know, noting that indeed also they require more um, communication and messaging to them for them to be able to understand what we're trying to do. And so really it's to say that government um, continues to draw onto these lessons. We are, um, should I say, um, trying to really be as dynamic as possible in changing our, our response strategies, uh, particularly in relation to what is happening right now with the feedback that we are getting. Um, and just appreciating really all teams who've worked with us um, to make this possible. Um, we've had a lot of support. UNICEF, WHO are giving us specialists um, who are working with us. Um, we have partners like yourself, NBCC, the private sector, um, Business Fights Poverty, who really come in in, in, a, in a major way to contribute to this fight and we really do thank you all for it and we remain open for criticism i always say um, i enjoy receiving feedback uh, many times Gideonji has sent me uh, messages much like the one he was sending the european union on whatsapp and so i welcome those messages because they only make us um, you know better in terms of deploying our response so thank you so much and over to you um dr Terry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doc. And I think uh, you, you've actually, towards the end, talked a, a lot around the need for behavior change, you know, understanding sociology, anthropology, human behavior. And no one better to speak about this than uh, Dr. Steven Jackson, uh, the UN resident coordinator for Kenya, who is actually an, a mathematician, anthropologist, sociologist. Dr. Jackson, you, you've worked a lot in Africa. Uh, you know, Burundi, Gabon, the Congo, you've worked on peace building, you've worked on all these missions, and therefore you understand the human behavior. So what kind of ecosystem is needed to enable the acceleration of vaccine uptake from this conversation and linking to what, uh, you know, Kazmo Gangi was talking about? Over to you, uh, Dr. Jackson. Well, Githinji, uh, CAS, uh, our various professors, thanks so much for the invitation. And Githinji, uh, I, I will turn out not to be much of a diplomat. I hope that doesn't disappoint you. Um, I'll do the diplomatic bit first and just really add to the congratulations that uh, CAS has already offered to NBCC 
Um, it's one year anniversary, really terrific work in a very short space of time. And we in the UN have been really proud to, to walk that journey with you. Um, uh, my predecessor, Sid, um, Arif, uh, who's on screen right now, uh, who sits on the board of NBCC. So I think that that's been a, a terrific collaboration. And maybe uh, one more diplomatic point is to say that I think NBCC is a shining example of the kind of multi-stakeholder, multi-dimensional approach that we need actually to both of the problems uh, that are yoked together, um, uptake and access in the, um, in the title of this, uh, this excellent uh, workshop. All right now the diplomatic gloves come off. Um, so I've been asked to speak about uptake, but if you'll forgive me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk as much about access as I am about uptake, because Githinji, you're, you're bang on the money. Um, I, I, by way of putting the two topics together, let me, and I hope he won't mind, I'm sure he won't, but if he does, uh, CAS can, uh, can, uh, can beat me up. Uh, I was online about a month or two ago with CS Cagway, and I said to him in good faith, I said, CS, how can the United Nations help you with the problem, the challenge of vaccine hesitancy in Kenya? And I'm only loosely paraphrasing his reply when he said, I wish that was my problem. I wish my problem was vaccine hesitancy. He said, I can't even get enough vaccine for the people that are ready to take it, never mind trying to persuade the people that aren't ready to take it. As I say, I'm, I'm only loosely paraphrasing his reply, and it really struck me. So let me talk briefly about the question of uptake, but then also uh, let me talk about vaccine equity, because it's a, it's a passion and a rant of mine as well, Githinji. Um, on uh, vaccine hesitancy, well, uh, WHO um, uh, director, um, Tedros, is on record as saying we're facing an infodemic, an infodemic that's at least as dangerous as the pandemic. There is mass global level disinformation. Um, there is great reluctance, not just in Kenya, but in Ireland and elsewhere. Um, there's enormous panic. Some of that, speaking as an anthropologist, is to be anticipated. And you can read anthropological studies going back 100 years and more on um, the cultural reception of vaccine within um, African society. It's a very, very interesting topic. Um, but really, so much of this now, I think, is about fighting a broad front war. And uh, Mercy, if I can call you that, I think you, you, you said it very adequately um, in what you had to say there. I'm interested in how the UN can help, and I'm interested in how the private sector can help. And that's why I think KBCC is so important. Um, we've had very good experience, Githinji, within the United Nations, Kenya, at pioneering public-private partnerships on a whole range of issues, ranging from the big four to, to the SDGs and beyond. And I do think that the private sector has a really key role to play here. Um, the private sector, as um, uh, in its um, uh, telecommunications uh, mode, um, the role that the, the safari comms of this world can play in getting um, reliable information out there and combating this infodemic. Um, I also think actually a little underexplored, it was very interesting in Gabon, where I was a uh, resident coordinator before, so it's an, an oil economy. To keep the oil platforms going, they had to vaccinate the oil workers. Then they used the oil workers um, as, as, a, as a means of public demonstration of confidence in the vaccine. They had oil workers appearing on the adverts. I got vaccinated. And that takes me to a number of campaigns that the UN has been able to do globally. Um, the first is WHO, um, its verified platform. I think having a single source of really reliable, trusted, verified information that knocks on the head, you know, this notion that you can ingest bleach to um, protect yourself against COVID or whatever the, the nonsense of the day happens to be. Um, so a platform like Verified, um, but then also um, a, a campaign like Hashtag Vaccinated that UNICEF has been running globally, um, where people who have been vaccinated can appear on social media, whether they're celebrities or ordinary citizens, and just say, I've been vaccinated, it's safe, jump in, the water's warm. Um, I think we need all sectors of society in this push. It is a multi-front war. Um, I think the private sector has a big role to play. Government, of course, has an enormous role to play. Uh, civil society, uh, the religious confessions, youth, women. Um, uh, I read a very disturbing study from the US today that actually said that vaccine um, skepticism is higher amongst American women than amongst American men. 
Um, this strikes me as bizarre and worth thinking about, um, but makes it all the more important then that we engage key populations that can get the message across. Uh, let me then in the dying moments that remain though, um, turn to this passion of vaccine equity, uh, Yitinji and, and friends. Um, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, um, in February of this year said in a global statement that the situation with regard to vaccine sharing around the world was, quote, wildly uneven and wildly unfair. That's a direct quote. Um, but I, little me, I had the temerity to tweet out immediately afterwards and say, well, you missed something, Secretary General. It's also wildly unwise. Never mind the equity arguments. We're blue in the face making equity arguments about climate change. Africa isn't the producer of climate change, but is the, the major casualty of it. Um, equity doesn't buy you anything as an argument anymore, but self-interest might. And what we're starting to see, and I hate to be the guy that is um, showing schadenfreude, but all these countries in the global north that are sitting a little bit complacently now and saying, oh, our vaccine rates are very high, we should be grand. And we're starting to see, and I'm not a public health specialist, so I don't want to start any, um, any rumors, but we're starting to see early evidence that the vaccines that we have may not be as effective against the Delta variant and new variants as we thought. And that is a biological illustration of the point that no one is safe until everyone is safe. And I do think, I don't want to be a, a global doomsayer, but I think that by the end of this year, we will see that shoe drop globally. I think we are going to see hitherto vaccinated parts of the world starting to see their cases climb again because of new variants that have emerged, guess where? In the unvaccinated parts of the world because the virus doesn't care if you're Kenyan or you're Irish or you're American, it will work where it works, it will mutate where it can. And so I do think, because here I am an optimist, a bit like you, Githinji, I'm not sure end of the year is the timing. I think early next, um, we're going to start to see that global realization hit home. And I do think at that point, the argument to open up intellectual property will become uh, incontestable. I think the argument to go into some kind of Marshall Plan mode of global production of vaccines will, uh, will become um, incontestable. And I do think by 2022, we're going to start seeing the vaccines coming. But, and you'll be relieved to know this is my final point and my, my final bit of, of, of prophecy for the afternoon. Um, that's great. Uh, so by 2022, uh, I suspect we will see the planet start to bring uh, COVID under control. But what's the key lesson learned for Africa? Equity arguments mm -hmm. and $2.50 will buy you a cappuccino in Starbucks. Um, equity arguments don't get you anywhere. Um, and uh, that you cannot rely on the global order to deal with a global pandemic globally. The borders go up, the boundaries go up. So Africa has to produce vaccine. And that's where I'll come back finally to this theme about public-private partnership. I think there are really interesting live conversations going on in Kenya and at the continental level, at least about establishing fill and finish capacity uh, on the continent and here in Kenya for vaccine, um, but preferably for full-scale vaccine production. It is perfectly possible. It is perfectly doable. Um, uh, I think there, are, there is commitment to this at the highest levels of Kenyan government, as well as at the highest levels of the African Union. And I think the sad lesson of this pandemic is that unless we produce vaccine locally, the next time there's a pandemic, we're going to be in the same situation. So, um, yeah, I guess I wasn't very diplomatic, Mr. Mm -hmm. Moderator. Um, but uh, it comes from the heart, and um, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing how the panel um, uh, can can uh, react to and help develop some of these points. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, I am really grateful, and I must congratulate you on your appointment. I know it's uh, it's many months now, but um, uh, congratulations on uh, the appointment by the Secretary General to take up this role. 
And clearly, we have a good partner for Kenya. Uh, so welcome. Uh, I feel very comforted that uh, your views are emotive, personal, and uh, not necessarily always diplomatic because we have to do the right thing. And um, uh, you know, we are coming to this question of public private partnerships. And I think, and maybe these are challenges also to uh, Dr. Bwagangi that as the government of Kenya looks at manufacturing vaccines, the place to start would be PPP rather than the government trying to do on its own and manufacturing its own site for vaccines, partner with an existing pharmaceutical company that has capacity, let the government support market shaping. Let's not go to it as a purely public venture. And I think that message was very clear. So yeah. maybe then this is the right time to segue to Professor Miriam Sidibe, a founder of NBCC, a founder of Brands of Mission, and somebody who is very passionate about PPPs for social good, which is exactly what, uh, you know, um, His Excellency Dr. Jackson has said. And, uh, you know, my reflections to the CS Morgangi. So, Professor Miriam Sidibe, what are your thoughts and experiences on how the private sector can help to accelerate the uptake, supply, access of COVID-19 vaccines? Uh, if you could speak to us about that uh, briefly. Over to you, Professor. Thank you so much, Dr. Gitinji. Um, it's a real pleasure here to meet, finally, Dr. Stephen Jackson. So, welcome, Karibu to Kenya. Um, we feel, um, we feel, I feel particularly relieved having heard you today to see that you will bring an equivalent amount of passion that Sid did um, to this particular sector. So welcome, uh, open arms to Kenya, um, as I say here as a non-Kenyan, <laughs> but who has been here for over 10 years and feel very much Kenyan at heart. Um, so, I, I mean, I love some of the words that have been said before me, um, especially around self-interest. You know, I am a public health doctor that I have spent 20 years practicing public health in the private sector. So for me, um, you know, I've always seen what's the role of the business models <laughs> that will actually try to be as inclusive as possible. So as I sit under my baobab, as you can see, <laughs> of brands and a mission, you know, what I'm going to do is take you back a little bit in the history of the setup um, of the National Business Compact and where we have actually started and gone from goodwill but also um, you know, trying to bring in skills and expertise. So you know, standing start in mid-March 2020, the National Business Compact for me has brought together business, development, government, enterprise, products, and communication. And we started very much from a starting point of you know, moving from just philanthropy to core business and policy engagement. And I'll take you through where we are. But we were all united behind one brand on a mission. And that brand on a mission was Commercial Corona, or Stop Corona, as you would say it in English. You know, Brands on a Mission is the company that I founded. It's a B Corp whose role is very much around accelerating impact in health and well being through prevention. And right from the start, it was around what can we do to accelerate, catalyze additional investment, but to start thinking. And there was no better mission than COVID 19 and what we could do in Kenya. Anybody who knows me knows that I've worked in hand washing for over 20 years. You know, I have the only TED talk in the world on hand washing. So, you know, all of a sudden here we were with a crisis that required hand washing to be forefront and center. So Brands on the Mission is now the home of National Business Compact on Coronavirus for the simple reason that we believe that health and well-being is the foundation of social justice and that businesses and more importantly, business models need to be a vehicle um, as a way to play in ensuring it's equal access, um, but, you know, uh, obviously to all. So the Kenyan National Business Compact has been defined as a blueprint for partnerships and coalition to respond to COVID-19 when we didn't have a vaccine. A year and a half later, I think we can be proud of what we've achieved, what we've achieved together, and we cannot, however, sit on our laurels. And more importantly, we need to think about these delivery models. You can move to the next slide. Um, the delivery models that we have created and how, you know, we tackle the next big fight ahead of us, which is access to vaccine. Um, the compact started in, you know, in the conversations between me, Gitinji, and um, the Marketing Society of Kenya, the UN SDG platform, and of course, you know, my home of over 20 years, Unilever. We were aiming um, at you know, the SDGs, but 
as we knew very quickly that COVID gave us that urgency and that sense of mission that we could do something. We had, you know, in the UN resident coordinator, amazing contacts, influence, dynamism, to be able to pull together the UN family as one, <laughs> to be able to respond. And obviously with the help of the Kenyan government at many different levels, we've managed you know, to make a positive impact on this dreadful pandemic that has been attacking our world. So I'd like to first start by congratulating everyone and congratulating in particular the government of Kenya and our chief assistant minister, Dr. Mercy Mwangangi, who had the courage <laughs> um, to jump into this partnership, believing that there was a role that somehow all these 51 companies and organizations that we put together could play in this unprecedented lockdown, risking livelihoods and votes and the economy <laughs> and children's learning in order to protect the nation's health. So, here we are again at a crossroad where we can make a huge difference and keep protecting many lives. And I think for that, we need to congratulate ourselves that we're going to take again some bold steps around what we do to keep prevention top of mind. So whilst COVID is clearly showing us that they're somehow here to stay, it's also showing us that there's a pathway in which we can boost our economy and keep the self-interest motive at the forefront of the conversation for many of these businesses. Because without these businesses being active, we will not be able to restart the economy the way we want to. And if COVID has taught us anything, it has taught us that we must be prepared. And we need to bridge the divide between the haves and the haves not. And at the heart of this is not only information, it's access to knowledge. <laughs> it's access to where we can find the solutions and how to make people a little bit more resilient, from resilient businesses to resilient community. So, Anybody who knows me again will know that I've spent 20 years telling people to wash their hands um, with soap for my entire career. I spent 15 years in the world's largest soap manufacturing companies, you know, run the world's largest hand washing program and 1 billion people in over 33 countries. You know, we've always knew that hand washing with soap could make a difference to global health, but never did I ever realize that how important it would um, become in this grim year of 2020 and start of 2021. That prevention again is better than cure has always been at the heart of many of my conversation. And yet again, we need to know that it is important to combine this old life-saving habit with vaccines access, you know? So if I think about the kind of values that we've had an opportunity to re-examine during COVID-19, to look at what we're doing and why we did what we did, what became very clear to us is that the businesses with a mission are going to do better or have done better during this year and the years to come in COVID-19 than the businesses that did not embrace this mission and fully devote a lot of their business model, their supply chains, and their distribution system to combat COVID-19. So all businesses have suffered, but those that have dedicated themselves to helping people to buy their products, but to be to do more with their distribution than just selling consumerism, you know, have actually come out or are coming out of this in a much better shape. So just looking at what we've achieved together when we put together soap manufacturers that normally would have competed together, when we put together um, the greatest wheel of some of the best communication campaigns out there, when we put together some of the best business networks available in Kenya, when we put together some of the best digital experts with the best youth network, what we've achieved is obviously mobilization of cash in kind, in, co in, in contribution. We've initiated campaigns that have reached over 1.8 million households for TV um, across the nation. We've reached over 24 million people in Kenya very quickly in the first six weeks and the last six months of this campaign, um, you know, reaching people through outdoors, TV, radio. We've rolled out hygiene facilities in over 72% of the 7,500 identified hotspots um, that the government had given us across Kenya. Um, together with AMREF and the NBCC Digital Partners, today again, we have been part of this study that we're going to hear more findings from Professor Osor about in terms of determining the key issues and the gaps in knowledge and attitudes on this COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy from obviously a target audience that may not be top of mind when you're thinking about you know, who's most vulnerable to COVID-19, but whose influence is undeniable, the youth, right? But I think um, the, yeah. the, the, sorry, the achievements- <laughs> Sorry. Are you yes, one more minute, one more minute, Prof. Yes, yes, that's fine. Uh, yes. So these achievements go much further than figures, however, right? 
I think by bringing some of these unlikely bedfellows, right? Some of the, the UK FCDO, Unilever, AMREF, um, some of the best uh, NGOs out there, what we've done is created new models of blended financing in a way that you could actually articulate these campaigns and reach networks that wouldn't have been reached on their own. By using some of these media platforms, which we'll hear about later on, We've put on mass behavior change communications at the heart of our work that has helped millions to do the best for their families and sensitive to these uh, constraints of trying to earn a very low income in the middle of these pandemics. Who could have a year ago believed that Johnson & Johnson, Pwani, Unilever, Rekit Ben Kaiser could come together in East Africa, highly competitive market to in an alliance to save lives. So what can we do today to be able to do the same when it comes to vaccine? How do you put these vaccine manufacturers together to do what we need to do to get vaccine uptake and vaccine access done in a way that we're not necessarily thinking about which brand we're going to adopt, but which household are we gonna protect? You know, how do we make sure that everybody is still washing hands whilst they're doing vaccines? And I think for me, as we hand and we think about this is what are we going to do to make sure that we keep vaccine hesitancy and hygiene so that we go hand in hand. So again, a big thank you to all the partners of NBCC, especially to the platforms um, that, you know, of Shujaz, Brick Moja, AI Influence, Heroes for Change and Why Act for letting us use their platform to undertake this research and reach the youth across Kenya. We can do this, that's the whole point, but the kind of partnership that we have highlighted and we've seen with NBCC is the way in which we create a much more inclusive business models that really delivers on this mission, allows us to all be united in a way that we can take on COVID. I've stayed in my four minutes, I believe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. I think none of the panelists has said in their four minutes. And must actually say that everyone has gone about second of the time they have spoken. So what I would like now to do is invite Rob Bennett. Rob is the one who, uh, in one time I visited his office and he talked around how the youth are about hope. Now, Rob uh, is a CEO of Shujas, and Rob will talk to us about the critical role that the young people must play in the COVID-19 crisis, especially on the vaccine update, uh, uptake. And you've seen, you know, all the parties here, the panelists have spoken about how we must increase uptake and reduce hesitancy. So Rob, over to you for your four minutes. Thanks, thank you, Githinji. And, uh, and thanks everybody uh, for including us in this panel. I think as Githinji mentioned, I'm, I'm Rob Burnett. I'm the, the CEO at uh, Shujaz Inc. And, and, and we run a big youth engagement platform um, really focused on, on helping young people to break down the barriers that prevent them from taking control of the future. So, so we very quickly took a position on, on COVID last year, and we've been very much involved with the NBCC and you know, everyone on this panel, uh, trying to make sure that young people um, were, a, were a big part of that picture. Uh, so I thought what I could, I could just show you were a few highlights from some of our own research. I know we're about to see uh, some findings from, uh, from a study that we participated in, but maybe some, some background numbers on young people. So, I think you've gone too many slides there, Maggie. If you could go back one slide, please. Um, uh, yeah, that's the one I was looking for. Um, so I think that the first important point that I wanted to, to, to sort of probably reiterate to everyone here is that young people are already the majority of Kenyans. Uh, so under 25, under 25 is already 60%. So three out of five Kenyans are under, under 25 right now. So, so young people are already the majority of our population. So they're not an add-on. They're not a group that we should, um, we should consider as an afterthought. They are Kenya today. I mean, the target audience for our work at Shijaz Inc. Is, is 15 to 24 year olds, and there are 11 million of them. And, and, and what's significant there is that of those 11 million young people, 80% live with their parents or their grandparents. So, so we've heard a little bit about, um, I think the public health professionals will tell us whether young people are themselves a critical target audience for vaccination, or whether they are a conduit for taking vaccination information to the country. And I think what we're seeing from these numbers is that they can be both. Um, we've done a lot of work and, and others have too about um, recognizing that young people can be the bearers of information into their homes, particularly young people who end up being more educated than their parents or educated than their, 
grandparents, they're, they're a trusted source for information. And, and that idea of a trusted source for information is incredibly important. And we've seen that, I think, repeatedly during, during the last 12 months. Who owns the information? Who controls the flow of information? Whose voice should we be listening to? Um, and so I think the, the second point I, I wanted to make is about, is how information is flowing in Kenya today. So 60% or 59% of, of young people in Kenya are connected to, the, connected to the internet. So whereas young people are online, their parents, their peers, in fact, the, the national average is only 20%. 20% uh, of Kenyans are, are accessing the internet or, or accessing social media, whereas 60% of young people are accessing social media. So, so actually, in terms of where information is coming, it is already dominating where young people get their ideas. And that's critical, and, and we've seen it to be critical during COVID because the flows of information have been unequal and, and they've been challenging for young people where when there's a void, uh, the void fills very quickly with fake news. And so some of the work we've been doing this year has been to try and identify and rebut fake news. And I think what we see is when there's a vacuum, falsehoods and illusions rush in. So as we think now about the, the challenge of vaccine uptake and vaccine hesitancy, what's the, what's the need for us to take a position? What's the need for us to harness the power of young people online to consolidate the truth to consolidate a stream of facts that can find their way into the households of, of Kenyans across the country. Because right now, there is a gap, and I think the numbers there on the screen, 38% of young people in January this year, only 38% of, of young Kenyans felt that they had access to reliable information. And that speaks to um, the, the, the gulf and the, the vacuum of information that exists. So, so there's a challenge there that young people are connected to the internet, but they're vulnerable to fake news. And fake news, by the way, is proliferating in this space. So as we think about the future, as we think about vaccine um, uptake and vaccine hesitancy, how do we make sure that there's a reliable source for information and that there's a trusted place where young people can turn so that they in their turn can take that message home to their parents, to their grandparents, to the ones who are truly vulnerable. Um, and I think the last point on this slide is this idea about um, whether young people feel as if they're part of the solution, or whether they feel as if um, their struggles are being reflected. And, and there's an overwhelming feeling about, from young people that they are not, that despite they being the, the majority, they don't feel as if they're included. And I think that's, that augurs badly for the future. Let's, let's go to the next slide, please, um, Maggie. Um, so, but, 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 it's, but it's not all bad news, right? Because some of our lessons from, from 2020, from the COVID year, have been the absolute enthusiasm of young people to contribute. And I think contrary to a lot of people's expectations and assumptions, young people have already shown their eagerness to step up and be part of the solution to COVID. Um, so young people do want to play an active role. They are highly driven by the desire to contribute, by the desire to acquire social capital, by being part of society, by being a positive part of society. And they want to feel valued. And, and we've seen it over and over during COVID that young people raising their hands to us and to others to say, let me know what I can do. Let me know how I can help. Let me know how I can be the bringer of good things to my community, to my family and beyond. 75% of young people said they already volunteered their time or their money during the pandemic to help. Um, but whereas there is a huge desire and an appetite to take part, we haven't caught it yet. We haven't provided the opportunity and the guidance and, uh, and the channels for young people to, to give back, to take that role that they urgently want. But, but when we have been able to do that, and, and in partnership with uh, NBCC uh, and, uh, and Rotary Club and others, we saw a some fabulous initiatives where we were asking young people around the country to set up hand washing stations with the soap provided by private sector partners with um, tanks and mutungis provided by a Rotary Club, but a huge, huge networks of young people raising their hands saying, include me, I want to be part of the solution. I will participate, give me a challenge, give me a task. I want to be part of this. So I think um, maybe the, my last thought, I, I, it, picking up on something that you said at the beginning, Githinji, um, whereas many countries in Africa have struggled even to distribute the vaccines that they've been given. I think you said 98% uh, of the vaccines that uh, have come to Kenya immediately found their way to, to uh, beneficiaries. 
let's be proud of the successes that we've seen last year. It's been struggle, but it's also been success. And I think the narrative that young Kenyans want to hear is, let us be part of the solution. Let's be proud of what we can do. And let's take that pride to the next wave, the next challenge, the next phase of the pandemic, because there's a massive resource there, millions of young people who are willing and ready to play a role. And, uh, and I think they are a, an asset that we can all be proud of and that we can engage with and take it and, 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 and walk forwards with together. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Um, thank you for that. And uh, I think you reflected very well on the role uh, that young people can play there. And I think as the ministry is also here and the partners are here, and I've seen also issues around technology and the role of technology platforms coming up on the chat. So there is quite a bit to be discussed here, but we are running out of time. And um, I would, I would uh, like to request Zahid, because my, my view is that because the panelists have dealt a lot with the issue, so we could skip the panel section, uh, the panelists uh, conversation, I would request the panelists to answer as many questions on the chat as possible so that we get time to go straight to Professor Ausul. What do you think, Zahid? Can we proceed, Professor Ausul, for the presentation? And then the panelists are requested to answer questions on chat as they are. Good idea, Dr. Kenneji. Okay, Zahid. So, Professor Ausul, then let's proceed to you. And then at the end, we also have a video from, um, you know, um, uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Sidibe, uh, who is the Africa Union Special Envoy on African Medicines, and we will run that video at the end, which is on the role of Africa Union in creating a sense of urgency concerning the uptake of COVID-19 vaccine across Africa. So that video will run at the end. For now, I ask Professor Osur, and if possible, Prof, if you could do this in maximum 15 minutes, that would really be appreciated. Over to you, Prof. Thank you. Um... I'm trying to put my presentation mode, but as I do that, I want to say I come from Amref International University. We not only train uh, transformational leaders in, in uh, health, but also generate evidence uh, for action, for policy, as well as for um, um, implementation. Um, what's going on here? Prof. Yeah. It's down there, that's the small button. You can't see it on your screen. Uh, just a minute. No, uh, along that line, the, you know. Uh, the TV. The small TV section. No, it's not that. Move, move back, think move back is... your arrow. Yeah, so you're not is, seeing it. That's it. Some, no, something is blocking it. Let me try. Okay. To, yeah. Uh, let, let me request for control. I do it for you because I can see it clearly and then I'll give it back to you. Uh, there you are. I'll give you back the control. We are fine, Prof. You Thank you. Yeah, so there's a panel which was blocking it. Thank you for that. Um, I will take the shortest time. This had been slated for 30 minutes, but I'll try to um, make it shorter. Um, we did two studies on vaccine hesitancy in Kenya. Uh, this is as an example to what is happening across Africa. Let me start by saying that um, this is what you know, vaccine acceptance rates vary across the world and um, there are very high acceptance rates in Asian subcontinent, uh, China and so on. And as you come to Africa, it reduces, um, it gets lower and lower. And if you look at vaccination rates, I think people have talked about this. Um, Africa, most of our countries are below 1%. And uh, this is because one, vaccines are not available. Secondly, health systems may not be ready to deliver. But the third thing which we are talking about today is communities not being ready to receive the vaccine. We have seen slow uptake and we've seen um, issues of vaccine expiry 
in some countries um, and, and some countries giving vaccines to others. Now, vaccine hesitancy <coughs> is um, a spectrum. It's a spectrum. There are those who accept the vaccine and so they go for it. There are those who refuse it totally. And in between, you have a number of um, different scenarios. Uh, some get it, but they are still unsure whether they should even get it. Uh, others don't just want it and so on. So it's a spectrum of things. It's neither refusing or accepting, but a spectrum of many things. Let me go to the problem of study that uh, we conducted. Um, AMREF and our partners work a lot with communities. And when we heard that vaccines are coming, we said we want to mobilize communities to have the vaccines. And so we needed some intelligence from the communities on how to do this, and also to be able to influence policy and practice on how to um, do vaccination for COVID in communities. There was not much information available uh, for that intelligence. And so we rolled out a number of vaccine hesitancy studies. I'm going to present two of those today. Actually, I'm going to give you snapshots of some of the results that we have from those two studies. Um, the objectives of these studies um, is just to assess uh, vaccine behavior intentions. We did these studies before the vaccines were available to our groups uh, participating um, study participants. And so it was intention, what do you intend to do um, when the vaccine becomes available? This is just about two months ago when we were doing these studies. Uh, I think the vaccine had just arrived in Kenya and it was at that point only for health workers and essential um, uh, service providers. And so it was not available to anyone. So we wanted to know when it becomes available, what do you intend to do? Uh, we wanted to assess proportions of those willing to be vaccinated and reasons for hesitancy. And we were using the WHO uh, Strategic Advisory Group of Experts, the SAGE framework, uh, which is here, looks at contextual uh, influences, uh, the individual and society and group influences, and the vaccine and vaccination uh, specific issues um, that make people not go for vaccination. So this framework is what we are using to assess reasons why. I will not talk up much about um, the methodology of the study. Uh, we have those uh, in case anybody needs them. Just to say, these were two stage um, method studies consisting of a cross-sectional survey and FGDs. Uh, for the CHV study, uh, we did four counties, two urban, Nairobi, Mombasa, one nomadic, that is Kajiado, and one rural agrarian, which is um, Transoya. And we were targeting active community health volunteers uh, who are actually in the community and doing uh, the work of a CHV. And uh, the basis of studying CHVs is that in our thinking, if they accept the vaccine and they know about, uh, about it, then they will communicate about it to communities and they will mobilize communities. Now, our second study was on the youth. Uh, so we used, as you've heard, the social network groups, um, which Professor Sidibe talked about. And uh, the basis for this was, we know in this era of um, COVID, we are more globalized. We, we are more connected through social media. And the youth seem to be having a lot more information than anybody else. And so they influence their families and their communities. So we expect group behavior that is influenced, not just by traditional adults as it was in Africa before, but by the youth who now seem to be the ones having the most recent information. Let me give a snapshot of the vaccine hesitancy uh, results of our youth study. And then after that, I will talk about the CAP. Uh, we, we studied, um, so if you look at the, the, the ages, um, most of these uh, people studied were between the age of 18 and 23. Um, the males were 60%. The majority were Protestant Christians at 53%, followed by the Catholics at 43, and then uh, Muslims at 2.3. Most of them had finished uh, high school. Uh, a number were in colleges, mid-level colleges or universities. 
but there are still a number also in secondary schools and primary schools. Now, if you look at these youth, the ones who are ready to get vaccinated as we talk, because this is just about a month, two months ago, is 42%. 58% are not ready. And six out of that 58% uh, um, are totally unwilling uh, to get vaccinated, while 52% are waiting to see what happens to other people before they can get vaccinated. And if you ask these youth, therefore, um, what they, whether they think uh, their friends and relatives should get the vaccine, actually up to 60% say they should. Um, and if you ask them further, whether um, community mass vaccination is important, 71% of them say it is. So what you're seeing is actually a situation where only 42 are ready to be vaccinated, but the majority believe that their friends and relatives should get it. And even a bigger majority believe that communities should have mass vaccination. That tells you that there is a problem with me. Um, is it okay for me? Am I safe uh, to have this vaccine? We know it is important. They have information that it helps everyone else, but for them, there is a bit of worry and the hesitancy therefore among the youth was found to be 58%. When you look at reasons why the youth don't intend to get vaccinated, 65% of them say it is because information is not adequate. And this is followed by safety concerns and whether the vaccines are effective. When you look at among the people who don't want or who are waiting to see, uh, those who are not ready to get vaccinated, and you look at their demographics, most of them are actually uh, female. Males seem to be likely to be the first to get vaccinated when the vaccine becomes available. And uh, people have always thought uh, traditionally that the, the Catholics are, are against vaccines because of previous, uh, you know, things they have said. But in this study, we find the Catholics to be more ready to accept the vaccine than the Protestant youth. And when you look at the level of education, then people in primary and secondary schools are more accepting of the vaccine than those who are uh, in post-secondary uh, school or colleges or universities. Now, um, when you taking the SAGE framework again and look at the contextual determinants, youth who feel that information on COVID is being openly shared are likely to get vaccinated compared to those who feel that it is not. And we'll be going more into this. And youth who have come across negative information on COVID again are unlikely to get vaccinated. Where are the youth getting information? Mostly social media, 40% of them, and then radio and TV. Um, and when you look at um, the source of information, who is getting information from where? The ones who are likely to accept the vaccines, that is the males, um, those in primary school and secondary school, mostly they are getting their information from radio and from TV compared to social media. And those who are getting information from social media are more likely not to accept the vaccine. And they are also more likely to be those who are having education of above secondary and who are female. So uh, other things that we find is uh, vaccine acceptance is associated with um, the belief that it protects others and that mass vaccination is important. And uh, when it comes to vaccine safety, um, the, the main issues associated with refusal to take the vaccine include low trust in the health system and whether the health system can actually deliver the vaccine uh, safely and low confidence on the safety of the vaccine and um, whether the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, we had a lot of themes that came up in the FGDs, but the issue of conflicting information on the vaccine, very important, that the youth are saying there is so much conflicting information we don't know what to believe. And then uh, 
Some believe that it does not affect young people, this COVID, and that um, the vaccine does not even work and that the vaccine is harmful. And the issue of trust, maybe this, uh, uh, Dr. Mwangangi, this is of interest. The issue of trust keeps coming up that they cannot trust what uh, the ministry is telling them. And men uh, seem to be having more acceptance than the females. So in conclusion for the youth study, um, we have a hesitancy of 58%, mostly females, Protestants, and those with post-secondary education, and lack of information and concerns around safety and effectiveness are the main issues. Social media seems to be contributing to hesitancy, and other factors contributing include low trust in the Ministry of Health and the belief uh, that uh, mass vaccination is not helpful. Those who believe this do not go for vaccination. Um, we recommend that there is need to really design and implement a communication strategy that focuses on the youth and their special needs because they are influencers in their family. And that the rollout of COVID vaccine should consider um, gender issues that are coming out clearly. And we work more with uh, religious leaders, especially of the Protestant faith um, to manage the hesitancy there. And also the Ministry of Health, I don't know what the ministry will do, but there is need to really work a lot more to enhance the trust of the people uh, in the ministry. I want to give a few snapshots on our CHV study. Um, a lot of things are quite similar actually with what you find among the youth. Um, we, we studied these four counties and overall, uh, the hesitancy among CHVs is 19%. But this can be deceiving because when you go deeper into looking at um, the, the counties, you find a county like Mombasa having vaccine hesitancy among CHVs of 41.5, and then Kajiado 22. So um, 19 is, is, is a bit confusing because you need to go specific. Um, but factors associated with acceptance of the vaccine County of origin really important. So there are specific things in those counties that are making people either accept or, or, re, uh, or refuse uh, the CHVs. And then their level of education and previous exposure to training on COVID. Um, sex and age and religion, years of experience in service, not significant at all. Other factors that are important, um, in Kajado we found culture to be an issue. Um, low trust again, in the Ministry of Health decisions on vaccine. I think there is really need to work, do something to improve this. And then um, in Nairobi, people trust that there is a good intention uh, for the manufacturers of the vaccine. Mombasa, when you think of individual influences and why it is so different, many CHVs in Mombasa, even though by that time there had be not been a much vaccination, in Kenya, the CHVs there believe that majority uh, that um, um, they have seen or they know people who have had bad reactions to the COVID vaccine. And I think this could be because they're interacting with media from all over the world. And again, most of those refusing uh, say that uh, information on the vaccine is not being shared openly. Um, on vaccine safety issues, the majority of those not intending the CHV is not intending to take the vaccine, have concerns over safety again, and a lot of things on this. Now, um, on the issue of safety, a uh, very interesting finding in Nairobi that a significant majority of people in Nairobi, in the, the CHVs in Nairobi, actually believe that the Ministry of Health can manage risks of uh, the vaccine and that they trust the Ministry of Health to deliver the vaccine. But those counties outside Nairobi are different in this. They say, no, we don't trust the ministry can do this and we don't think our health system can deliver the vaccine safely. Um, just a quick one on where they are getting their information. Um, what I can say, TV and radio remains the most important source of information even for CHVs and that um, it's also associated um, with a tendency to get vaccinated or to accept the vaccine, that is radio and TV, while social media and community meetings 
are associated with tendency not to accept the vaccine. What does this mean for the CHV and their role in the community? We found a strong correlation between CHV vaccine acceptance and their readiness to engage with communities. And so it can be expected that counties with high hesitancy among CHVs are also likely to lag behind in their vaccine act, uh, mobilization and, and uptake. In conclusion for the CHV study, uh, we find an aggregate hesitancy of 19%, but with a wide variation between counties and the determinants of hesitancy majorly being safety concerns, trust in the Ministry of Health and uh, vaccine manufacturers, and source of information playing a major role on who accepts or refuses. And that vaccine hesitancy among CHVs, which is very high in some counties, is likely to negatively impact the rollout. And finally, on recommendations, we recommend that we train CHVs on COVID vaccine to reduce hesitancy. Um, I can say that in our study, we found more than 70% of CHVs in some counties have not been trained at all, and they are expected to go and mobilize communities. We need to enhance provision of information. I, need, I think um, we need to strengthen Ministry of Health as source of information for CHVs because they are health workers rather than social media, TV, radio, because those who have been trained basically got information from the ministry and they are more accepting of the information um, of the vaccine. And then we need to strengthen the health system response in counties outside of Nairobi so that the trust that the CHVs have in the capability of the health sector to deliver the vaccine safely is improved. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much, Prof. I think there's a lot to learn there aligned with the conversations we have had and uh, also very useful for the ministry and for all those partners here, the UN and the others who are actually planning on how to support the public service in every country. And uh, what I would like to say is, the results presented here can be replicated into other countries. So they are not uh, you know, specific. The specificity to the country is low. So they can be used across any of the other countries. We have uh, uh, you know, relatively run out of time. So I would like to, there was a video by um, uh, Mr. Sidibe Maggie. Is that video ready to run it? Because then after that, I'm going to ask um, for closing remarks from Arif Neki, who is a senior advisor UN Strategic Partnerships uh, in the Resident Coordinator's Office. Maggie, do we have the video or do I call uh, Arif to close? Thank you. Egan, please play the video. Thank you. From the outset of this meeting, I want to thank the organizer the subject of today is topical and timely. Topical and timely because of the COVID-19 pandemic is not uh, only a public health crisis, but also a crisis with a human security dimension that calls for uh, an approach that protects the most vulnerable and that offers the opportunity of science for everyone everywhere. The coronavirus pandemic has also placed an emphasis on the need to strengthen African health diplomacy in a world that is globalized. In the absence of such coordinated and appropriate African health diplomacy, the issue of access to vaccine for the most vulnerable in Africa against COVID-19, for example, will continue to highlight the great divides in our globalized world. On one side, those who have it, and on the other, those who are left behind. The demand for COVID vaccine raises major ethical questions that has increased the scientific, medical, economic, social, and indeed political divides. The only way to reduce the risk of uh, non-vaccine resistant mutations in the world is to reinforce vaccination and associated public uh, health measures everywhere, especially 
in the developing world and in Africa. Unfortunately, vaccination is progressing far too slowly in Africa to achieve this. There appears to be no sense of urgency in the world. Supply is simply insufficient to meet Africa's demand and rich countries currently have the monopoly over the available supply of vaccines. Only 1.6% of the world's vaccine have been administered in Africa. Out of a population of 1.3 billion, only 8 million Africans have received two doses of vaccine. More than 1.2 billion people have not received a single dose of vaccine, and at the current rate, much of Africa may not be vaccinated until 2024. This painful situation is having an impact on vaccine hesitancy in many countries. If all vaccines require two doses, as is the case for the vast majority of WHO-approved vaccines, administered in Africa, 1.6 billion doses would be needed to immunize 60% of the African population. As of the end of April 2021, only 1.2 billion doses of vaccine had been produced worldwide, far short of the 10 to 15 billion doses needed to stop the spread of the virus. The risk of vaccinating only rich countries means that the epidemic could become endemic across the developing world and more particularly in Africa. Without rapid vaccination at an affordable cost and with maximum coverage, we will lose our race against mutation worldwide and in Africa, and this could lead to a prolonged pandemic. The problem of production capacity, however, will remain throughout 2021 and possibly into 2022 and 23. Especially since India stopped exporting COVID-19 vaccine in mid-April, leaving the 92 low and lower middle income countries that rely on the program in a bind. The shortfall is estimated at 190 million doses as of the end of June 2021. Building on the lesson learned from the current crisis, we should accelerate the setting up and rapid operationalization of African Medicine Agency. More specifically, leveraging the African Continental Free Trade Area the African Medicines Agency will help build Africa research and development capacity, harmonize regulations in drug registration, help country comply with best practices and international standards, strengthen the fight against substandard and counterfeit medicines and medical products while fostering the building of an enabling environment for continental production of medicine and vaccine. The rapid implementation of this innovative and long-awaited treaty is essential to contribute to the implementation of universal health coverage, improve human security, and better meet the need of the most vulnerable in the continent. Thank you. Thank you very much. To bring that video down there, reinforcing the importance of ratification of the Africa Medicines Agency is the envoy, the Africa Union envoy for the Africa Medicines Agency, which is critical to vaccine manufacturing in Africa, as was spoken about earlier by Dr. Jackson and others. Now, it's my pleasure to invite Arif Naki to make his closing remarks for this session, which has been fantastic. And uh, Arif Naki, this is your time now. Arif, uh, take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Githinji. Uh, thank you, uh, 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 our excellent speakers. 
Um, I think this has been an extremely rich and uh, inspiring conversation. Um, we've heard uh, some very interesting uh, uh, inputs from uh, well, Dr. Githinji himself, I think, set the tone when he talked about uh, vaccine inequities, 10% clinical trials in Africa with 1.6% only in terms of vaccines administered. And that alone tells us a, a, a lot, uh, in addition to which there's fiscal inequities, issue of absorption of vaccines. Um, we also heard from uh, 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 Dr. Mercy Mwangangi, uh, what she basically has experienced. Literally, I mean, I, I really value the input from Dr. Mwangangi because she's on the front line of what is happening in Kenya. She's the face of the COVID response and, and, and doing a fantastic job. And she talked about, you know, the critical importance of partnerships, the crit being, in fact, the latest innovation, uh, structures, communications, dynamism, synchronizing uh, initiatives uh, in terms of deployment as well, but also agility, uh, very important, and the openness to criticism. And, and we really appreciate that. Uh, uh, Dr. Jackson, uh, the UN resident coordinator, spoke about, you know, hesitancy as a discussion being a little irrelevant if we don't have the vaccines in the first place. So the two issues are, are hugely linked. The issue of the infodemic, uh, the, the fake news, uh, you know, the, 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 the tsunami of uh, social media rumors uh, that we need to combat. Um, some good practices and examples, uh, including with UN agencies around the verified platform, the uh, vaccinated campaign, but also talking about issues of equity, talking about how, you know, um, you know, vaccine uh, access uh, has been wildly uneven and wildly unfair, as the Secretary General put it. But in fact, in his opinion, also wildly unwise, because ultimately no one's safe until everyone's safe. And so it's a, in, in everyone's enlightened self-interest, rather than simply uh, issues of, uh, you know, equity and, and moral uh, obligations. It's about enlightened self-interest to make sure that, uh, that, that uh, uh, everyone is safe. Um, Miriam Siribe, you very passionately talked about, you know, the role of business models, the role of business engagement, our brands on a mission and the National Business Compact uh, really set out an exciting journey. Um, we've been, of course, very pleased to be part of it. And I'm privileged to, to, to be with all of you on the board. And she really talked uh, very much also about combining the, the aspects of hygiene with vaccine access and, 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 and adoption. And I think this is a very important nexus that we shouldn't forget. Um, we uh, understood very clearly that it's about profit with purpose. It's about enlightened self-interest for private sector companies to grow their markets, to create greater uh, consumer appreciation uh, uh, in this fight. So, you know, it's, uh, it's not just about, you know, uh, CSR or a small token philanthropy here. This is about core self-interest for private sector partners and creating the right business models and the branding around these business models is critical. Rob Burnett, some amazing, fantastic statistics uh, telling us that about 80% of young people, uh, you know, uh, li literally, uh, you know, live with their, main, with their parents. But in fact, in terms of the demographic bulge, they represent Kenya. And, and so they become important transformative conduits for, for, for credible information back to their families and their communities and are in fact ready to serve, ready to support. Uh, um, and the fact that about 60% of Kenyans uh, uh, have access to social media uh, uh, in terms of the youth, um, but only 20% uh, overall. Um, so very interesting. Uh, I, I really like Rob's point about where there is a vacuum in information. Falsehoods and, and rumors will, will step in. It's very important that uh, one addresses the issues and only 38% of youth actually felt they had reliable information. We had a, a, a very interesting uh, presentation of two studies by, by Professor Osur from the MREF University. Thank you, Prof. And, and I, won't, uh, I won't try and summarize those studies, but you all saw the stats, you saw the graphs. And this is critically important as we try and design a broader national campaign, uh, uh, you know, with uh, NBCC and, and private sector development partners, government and others as the next step. Um, I think what Professor Osur is giving us is the intellectual underpinning on how we need to get, go about this. So, so it's important that practice has some level of intellectual underpinning here. 
And uh, Mr. Sidibe in his video, I mean, uh, again, stressed that only 8 million uh, Kenyan, uh, Africans have been vaccinated from 1.3 billion Africans. So this is really uh, a huge issue. And, and uh, in terms of total vaccines, I mean, we, we only have 1.2 billion produced where we need globally 10 to 12 billion. And so in fact, this might stretch uh, even beyond 2022 into 2023 and 2024 for us to see how we can achieve some, some level of uh, reassurance, especially given the new variants and mutations that, uh, that will keep coming up. So I think it's been a really rich uh, 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 discussion. I thank you all, uh, Githinji, uh, as usual, uh, terrific uh, moderation. We really appreciate that. Um, special thanks to you, Dr. Githinji, to Cass, uh, uh, Dr. Mercy Mwangangi, thank you very much. To Dr. Stephen Jackson, and uh, we're delighted to have him in Kenya. And I, 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 I'm really enjoying uh, the uh, interactions we're, we're, we're having in terms of moving things forward. Uh, of course, Miriam, Professor Miriam Sidibe, uh, uh, always a power, power of uh, power pack of energy and passion and 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 uh, insights here. Uh, Rob Burnett, uh, delighted to have uh, have heard your presentations and. I think uh, we need to we need to keep you very close to us in terms of the work you're doing, and of course, Mr. Sidibe and, and his insights have been extremely useful. Um, Professor Osur, thank you all very much. Uh, um, I'd like to say a special thanks also to Maggie Rayaria, who has been uh, really the force behind the scenes. She's worked extremely hard. She's been on call 24/7. So, Maggie, a very special thanks to you from all of us. And finally, uh, um, you know, to say that, uh, you know, the messages I take home are seem to be starting with C's and Miriam and I were joking about this. And so it's about, you know, connect, converge, clarify, convince, communicate, build capacity, cultivate young people, call to action. And finally, congratulations to all of you for a wonderful uh, 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 symposium. Thank you all and have a good day. Thank you. Absolutely nothing to add. Thank you and stay safe. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Well yeah. done, Arif. Thank you. Thank you. Stay Bye -bye. safe and well, everyone. Stay safe and well. Thank you all.